Hey, good morning, and welcome to the Comics Experience Graphic Novel of the Month Club Kids Edition, the best one. I love the Kids Edition. Um, for the month of March of 2024, um, we've got a really good, fun book uh, this month. Well, we always have a good, fun book, but this one's especially good and fun. Um, and it is Aowulf of Monsters and Middle School. Um, and we are very, very lucky to be joined here uh, by, the, uh, by the creator, Mike Caballero. Hello, sir. Hey Brian, how are you? I'm I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing I'm doing very good. And um, before I get sidetracked, I just thank you so much, really, oh, for yeah. um, shining a light on on my book and and talking. You know, I'm I, I'm I'm a fan of your writing, and I've been following it uh, probably for longer than you would like to be reminded. <laughs> uh, so thank you for uh, everyone there for uh, having me on board here. Oh, I know. I appreciate it. And I mean, thank you for making a great comic. That's, that's the whole, that's what this is all about, right? Is celebrating good work. So, um, so uh, uh, I appreciate your thanks, but you should, you should like flip that in a mirror and it comes bouncing back at you because, because <laughs> that's, that's how it works. Um, uh, my first question is always the same question. I really like this question. It gets to sort of the core of, of what we are and what we're doing. And it's it's why comics of of all the ways you could be communicating, what is it about comics that like that touches you, that thrills you, that excites you? What do you got? Um, I think it really it's hard to put your finger on it. I mean, I uh, I grew up in the '70s. I um, had I well, was being exposed to. Um, uh, great sci-fi and fantasy, like that's always been my jam, right? I've always loved science fiction and fantasy. And, you know, at the time uh, I had, um, you know, Star Wars movies were coming out. Uh, there's the Bakshi, Lord of the Rings in the theater blew my mind. We had uh, Bakshi Spider-Man on TV. I, like it was a mix of reruns that were new to me. I didn't know they were reruns and some new stuff, you know, I just grew up on all that and I sought it out. George Reeves, Superman on TV, Christopher Reeves, Superman in the theater, Adam West, Batman, Wonder Woman on TV, Star Trek, that's a huge Star Trek fan. Um, uh, Ray Harryhausen uh, reruns, again, I didn't, I didn't know that a rerun from a new thing. I just loved Jason the Argonauts and, and Sinbad movies and, uh, Japanese monster movies, you know, on, on the East Coast. I grew up in Jersey. We had like uh, the 430 movies. So they, they would do Godzilla Week. Um, there was so much awesome um, stuff. And, and I think TV and film was, was my first. That was my gateway. I was also a, a voracious reader. I grew up down the street from our uh, local library. And um, I, I sought out similar stuff, you know. And, and I think, you know, 1970s, no comics in the library, right? No graphic novels, no, didn't have the term really. There are no comics in the library, but I think it's important to remember how visual uh, uh, books are, right? And I think that when you speak to cartoonists or illustrators of a particular generation, you notice that we all bring up like Edgar Rice Burroughs, Robert E. Howard, J.R.R. Tolkien, you know, like that that pulp, not Tolkien, but the, the other, the pulpy stuff, it's yeah. very visceral. It's, it's very visual, right? And um, I think for me as a kid, you're, you're taking in, you're absorbing this stuff, right? And for some of us, there's sort of an urge to put it out in, in some way, you know, yeah. you, you, you're, you have these vivid, this vivid imagery in your mind and you need to get it out. And we start to draw some of us, you know? Um, and so I was constantly drawing. So I had this love of narrative and storytelling, and I had this love of art and drawing, you know, and the process of, of drawing, the act of drawing was like a, a recreation for me, you know? Yes. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's inevitable. <laughs> You're inevitably, and then a couple more things happened that I think really push those two things together, you know, so then, you know, it's inevitable. Yeah. Were you, um, uh, cause you were talking about like libraries in the seventies. And I mean, it seems to me that we, we still had, we had strips that were available then. So I remember reading Doonesbury books, you know, and like Garfield probably from the library Does that comport with your memory too. Not for me. 
Uh, yes, I mean, that was there. Um, it, it, we weren't a newspaper family, really. Mm. So I came to the newspaper strips, which I'm now passionate about. They came as a revelation to me much, much later because uh, I skipped them really as a kid. Mm. You know, interesting. Uh, my, my parents, we, we got the newspaper. We weren't really big newspaper people. My parents are immigrants. They English is their second language. They kind of struggled with it. Like they kind of got the newspaper, but sure. it wasn't a, it, w- it wasn't a force in our, in our household. And, um, you know, I, I think I skipped it and went right to comic books because in my town, I grew up in this little blue collar town in New Jersey. And, um, on the main street was Maurice's barbershop that I went to from when I was old enough to get a haircut for as long as I lived in that town. And he had a new stand, a classic Mayberry style barbershop that people would just hang out in. And he had a little newsstand and he, for whatever reason, had like the, um, I guess they were the Harvey comics, right? It was Rich Rich, Wendy, Hot Stuff. I loved Hot Stuff. That's what he had. That was my, I think I skipped right to comics because I was seeing those when I would go to get my hair cut. Um, and I just, you know, kind of fell in love with that first. So I just kind of veered towards comics. Um, you know, what happened for me was, um, I, like I said, I was into all that stuff that I mentioned and I just burned through it. Like I was just obsessive with mm. this stuff. And I, I would, at some point you've read the Tarzan books you want to read. You've read the Conan books. You've read Lord of the Rings several times. Like you, you run out and I, I just specifically wanted more of the things I already loved from books and TV and film. That's what I wanted. I didn't want just sci-fi. I wanted Star Wars. I didn't want just fantasy. I wanted Conan, you know, and uh, I, I went to my, my friend, Mikey Vaughn had a birthday party and the, we were in grade school and the, the grab bag was a shopping bag, brown shopping bag filled with old comics and, I reached in and like I'm, I'm I'm already a Robert E. Howard reader and I reached in and I pulled out an issue of Cull the Destroyer and like my head exploded because if you were a Conan fan, you knew that Cull existed, but if you were a kid in the seventies, this was out of print. Like you knew it, it was there, but how do you, you there's no internet, you can't go on eBay and buy an out of print volume of Cull. You know, there's no way to get it. So I was like, oh my God, like this this is close enough, right? There's and there's one every month. You know what I mean? And that and that's what sent me into comics was like, oh, there's a Star Wars comic every month. There's a two Conan comics. There's several Batman comics. That that was the that, that birthday party was the revelation that I could have more of those things I loved and wanted now, right? Yeah. And on a monthly continuing on a monthly basis, that's what led me to comics. And then once once I was reading it, I was like, oh, there's all these other comics that you don't have to tie in, but they're awesome. And I was hooked. That that's what happened. Yeah. When did you when did you decide that um that that you weren't just hooked on comics, but that you wanted to make a career of it? Well, I think as I got older I got into high school, um, you know, I decided to started thinking about like I need to work. I need a job. And like my when I was fourteen I got my first job at the local comic shop in my town and this place was magic. It, it, it was the classic seventies, eighties, beautiful disaster of a comic book shop, right? You know what I mean? It's long boxes and clutter. Um, and it, um, we were heavily focused on the new wave of, in black and white independent books that were coming out at the time I was a huge love and rockets fan immediately um zot scott mcleod zot like that kind of stuff just like grabbed me the the possibility uh that like that's that's a one that's a guy it's one guy just making that right that blew my mind right um but the store also had this collection in the stock room that you know we we're constantly rotating the back issue stock and the back room had this extensive, thorough collection that went back to World War II or even older. So that was my education. And I was getting the cutting edge stuff that, you know, is legendary now, right? The new stuff. And, and this crash course 
and stuff that if you if you buy a history of comics book now, uh, which we didn't have, you know, if you bought that now, there'd be all the stuff that they would talk about this pivotal stuff. I would just come across it trying to rotate stock, and I would I would come out with a handful of something, walk up to my boss Alex, and I'd be like, "What's this?" And be like, "Oh," and he was like very knowledgeable, you know. Um, to be like, oh, that, yeah, that's, that's, you know, this, and, and I would, that was my education, I just fell in love with everything about it, this, the, the books themselves, the, what had come before, the history of it, uh, what, what the, what it had as a potential uh, for the future, right, like what we could do with this thing, um, uh, the, the stories themselves, the, the people behind, you know, the stories, the artists, the, the writers, like it just, I, I loved it, you know, and it was fascinating. It was like this secret, right? Um, this wasn't taught in schools. There were no books talking about any of these people or any of these events yet. You know, now now we're culturally obsessed with with digging into this, but it, there was sure. nothing at the time. It was a, it was a secret word yeah. of mouth narrative, right? That just it was magic, you know. And um, and I and I I gotta say personally, at the time. You know, now we're, we're mid to late 80s. You know, at the time, there was this growing feeling, you know, that I, I kind of want to hip check the comics journal, you know, as one source, I, you know, love it or hate it. Um, but there was this feeling of, you know, you, we can continue to say, like, uh, it's just a comic. Like, we can keep doing that, right? But there's a world of comics where uh, the, the the stories and the people behind the stories are highly regarded, right? And these no. things are held to the critical standards of a film or a novel. I'm like, we can have that here, you know. We, you know, it's it's fun to have a book that's just a slugfest. I like that, you know. But we can have other things, right? And and uh, the Comics Journal was a proponent of this idea of we're like we, we can hold ourselves to a, another standard and have another thing. And I think. Looking back, I, in retrospect, like I think there was a wave of people, and like if you can draw and write, you're one you're one of my contemporaries. You know, there were people who couldn't draw or write, right? And and maybe they became librarians or maybe they became educators, but they got turned on the comics at the same time. We had Watchmen, we had Dark Knight, we had Born Again, we had Mao's being serialized in Raw magazine, right? There, there was something that was happening. Even if it was going to be a superhero book, we can have a higher standard, yeah. right? Um, and I think that really turned on a, a generation of people. We didn't, we didn't know we were connected. It was happening everywhere, right? Um, and 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 we were maybe not so aware that it was happening outside of our, uh, maybe just us. I might have felt it was happening to me, you know. But looking back, when I, when I, now uh, when I talk to librarians or do a book talk or something, you realize. There's that. Like, I, I spent I spent a lot of my younger years in, in a band, right? Tour five US tours, seven other countries, we made records and stuff. And the sa- I, I think I saw this in comics because I realized then the same thing. When, when you would travel, you would see like you thought you were the only one who knew about that band that that inspired you, made you go buy a guitar, right? And learn a few chords. And as you travel, you realize everyone there's a there's a substrata of, of people who bought that too sure and, and so it, it, they either started the band or can't couldn't play they're all thumbs so they started booking shows right or they didn't want to do that so they made a zine right or they established a little record label and all of it is interdependent you know yeah. and right and comics i think were the same right where we yeah. have what we have now because Everyone got turned on and, and contributed, you know, what what they could, right? Yeah. It was a wave, that, a, yeah. a tide that, you know, lifted a there's, lot of ships. Right? There's there's yeah. this there's this other thing that happened that you know I don't know that um, kids today who have grown up with the internet in their pocket um, really understand or even have the tools to really understand. When you were a fan of something back in the 80s and, and the 90s, you had to be a fan of it. Like you had to work really, really hard to find it and to learn about it. And 
Now, if you look at a book and you're like, oh, what is this? And you just type it into Google and it spits out things. So, so I feel like there's a more maybe surface level of understanding of these subcultures now, you know, like, again, if you, if you like some band, you can just instantly hear them. You can instantly hear them. And so there's not as much you didn't, since you didn't struggle it, there's, there's slightly less of a, um, of a, it, it gets hooks in you. If, if that makes sense, you know, you don't have that Indiana Jones moment of f finally finding that thing where, you're, exactly. where you've, you've unearthed it, you know, exactly. That you exactly. feel like you got struck by lightning, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I remember, you know, because, you know, when we were kids, uh, if you if you wanted to watch something on television, I mean, you you had to you had to go at the time that it was being shown. It wasn't like you could just watch it whenever you wanted. And I, I vividly remember seeing um, seeing the Ruddles, uh, the, the Beatles parody uh, on PBS uh, and it only showed once. And I was like, I was fascinated by it. And and like I spent I spent probably two years looking for the LP. Um, ah. uh, until I finally found it in, in a store of like, oh, now I can listen to the whole thing. I was, you know, and that excited me even more. I, I don't know. Sure. I, I, I kind of, I kind of miss those days in a way though. On the other hand, you, you can now just look in your pocket and you can get everything. And that's kind of cool too, you know? Absolutely. Uh, you know, like newspaper strips are a great example where like, I mean, what a golden age we're in right now. Yeah. You know, I talk about that black and white boom, but yeah. look at where we are, man. I, you can you can almost check out anything. Yep. You know, you can find almost anything and check it. If yep. you hear about it, something there's probably a collection yep. or something. You know, yep. it's great. It's amazing. Yeah. No, very much so. Very much so. Um. So you did you. You, I, I know the answer, so this is a leading question. Did you go to school to learn how to draw comics? Yeah, so as, I, as I'm saying, you know, I, we get into high school, I'm working in this shop, I'm, I'm, I'm in now, I'm a lifer at this point. Yeah. And, I, you know, those, those two passions that I had since I was a kid about, I, I loved storytelling and I, I loved um, drawing. As I'm about to graduate high school, I started to think, C can you be a writer? You know, is that a thing? You know, I mean, my dad is an auto body mechanic. My mom was a seamstress, you know, like we're very blue collar background. And here I'm, I'm like, can you be a writer? Uh, or maybe I can be an illustrator. There's that Frank Frazetta guy. What does he do? And, <clears throat> and that was, that was the light bulb moment. That was, it hit me because of comics. I realized I, you don't have to choose, you know, you don't have to choose between being a writer and being an artist because here's this amazing art form that almost demands that you do both. Sure. Right. And so it's the late eighties. And at the time, if, if that, if you're really contemplating that there's only one place to go. So I went to the Joe Kubert school, uh, which was in Dover, New Jersey, still there, you know? Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that was, it was a three year course. I did, I did two years of the, of the three year course because I'm young and arrogant and I knew everything. Right. And I, I was like, I, I'm, I'm good to, I'm good to go. I'm going to go make comics now. But I, I learned a lot of great teachers. I had Erwin Hazen, um, Tex Blaisdell, uh, Joe Kubert, um, Hi Eisman. I had great teachers, you know, I mean, they taught us, they taught us how you make comics in the, in the 1930s, forties. I mean, like we were really using, old materials and, and stuff, but it was a great, you know, there was no computers. It was a great education. And then I uh, thought I was going to go um, make some comics on the side while I made music with my band and I did some of that, but I had a really hard time getting work. So I was just washing dishes um, to make a living. And um, what was, what was happening? was that um, I wasn't the only Kubert student from that time to not go back my third year. And so some of the, the, my fellow students also didn't go, uh, go back. And I, I want to I specify this, you know, because he just passed away. You know, Jose Delbo, if you don't know, look up Jose Delbo. Um, he's one of these guys who's worked from about 1959 to almost just a couple years ago. He's one of these guys who did 
month in and month out, did beautiful, solid work associated with Wonder Woman a lot. Jose was teaching there at the time. And he just, the guy just took a moment to write a, a message to some editors that he had worked with who were starting a company to just say, could you, could you check out these kids' portfolio? Give them some pointers. Could you check these kids out? So two of my friends um, got sent to Valiant Comics, which was just starting at the time, and they got hired. And then there was an opening, and they got a couple other friends from school hired. And then there was an opening, and, some, and one of them thought of me and, you know, and set me up with an interview. And I went, and I showed my work to Bob Layton. Mm-hmm. And and for some reason, uh, Bob hired me, and that was my start. And comes hired me as a colorist, which is I didn't want to color. I I was I wanted to be Scott McCloud or Jaime Hernandez, right. um, but my my drawing was not there yet. I I just didn't know it. <laughs> my, my drawing was not ready for prime time, um, but I could paint, and and I and um, you know we were painting by hand, and uh, that that was how I started. That um, you know. Uh, Jim, Jim Shooter was still there. Uh, mm-hmm. Bob was sort of kind of really working directly with the artists. Um, he, he gave a lot of people their first jobs. And um, and I worked there for several years, and that was sort of my introduction to comics. Nice. No, that's very good. Um, uh, how, did your, how did your parents feel about uh, you going to college, you know, in comic school, essentially, and and, and yeah. an art career because because as you said they were hardworking immigrants uh, blue collar like that must have been that must have been a, an interesting emotional challenge for them yeah yes uh, you nailed it um, my parents uh, my my dad passed away a few years ago and my mom is uh, thankfully still with us um, I I will say that in, generally speaking I'm not sure especially at that time that my parents had any idea what I was talking about. Um, they got that it was art kind of, and they could not have been more supportive within their means. You know, um, they never, uh, they never did anything but encourage and support me to do, you know, in their words, anything I wanted to do, you know, I, I don't know why it's not, it wasn't practical. It certainly didn't make sense. Um, but they, both of them just never questioned to me. I don't know if they had conversations when I wasn't around, but to me, it w- they, they did anything to push me forward on this thing that I said I, I wanted to do. And they, and they always remained that, you know, and then once I started working, it was a toss up where I think they understood what some of the jobs were and there were others that they, they were, I don't, I don't think they quite understood a lot of it. You know, there were some things that they understood, uh, you know, if, if I, I spent a dozen years in animation, right. And like when I could put something on the TV and be like, I, I painted that background, they'd be like, Oh, you know, like that kind of was something that made sense. You know, some of the other stuff, it was a little more like, weird where you know, you know behind the scenes work where they maybe didn't understand but they always encouraged they always yeah. encouraged yeah so how did you go from doing color to doing your first book long that's a long road um i couldn't i i felt at the time i could not get a break and you know once i started coloring i felt pigeonholed i mean again you've spoken to enough artists to know that we see things through these lenses that I don't know. Sure. I felt like if I presented something that people would be like, your colors, especially we're talking about the nineties. There's no book market. Yeah. Um, my drawing's weird. My sensibilities are, are, are weird by those standards. Right. And um, I, I felt like, and then I, I, I fell into this job at MTV animation very weird. It fell in my lap. And um, um, I started with a gig that related to color. Color was always my doorway into things, right? Um, So they hired me as a colorist because they were trying to make a book and they didn't know how to make a book. They knew how to make broadcast art. They didn't know Mm -hmm. how to print it. And so they were having trouble. And I, I got in there as someone that could help them resolve their 
formatting problems to make a book because I had print experience. And once I got in there, I was like, I'm staying. <laughs> I need to figure out how to stay in here. And, um, you know, in, in animation, traditional, the test for a, a position, I, I took every test, whether I understood it or not. And I, I got, um, luckily, I, I got hired as a storyboard revision artist. So I was, I was suddenly drawing. And, and there's a funny thing that you discover um, you know, the, I, the animation folks had no problem with my drawing, you know, um, and what, what, what's funny, and I think persists to this day, is that comics people uh, are like, oh, my God, you worked in animation. That's amazing. You're hired. Right. And, and animation people are like, oh, my God, you worked in comics. Really? You're hired. Like there's this <laughs> mutual. It's weird, you know, and, and it sure. is smoke. It's sure. totally smoke, you know, yeah. but it played. It, it was it played to uh, it favored me at the moment you know I, it helped me get in an MTV and and then I was you know I've, I became a storyboard artist and I did that for a number of years and and uh, when you're drawing 30 panels 30 loose rough panels but 30 panels a day um, I, I realized like I can do comics I mean you know because I want to say something happens there's like a Stockholm sy syndrome I think that is the result of freelancing, right? Especially if you get into a niche or a groove as a freelancer, um, even if you aspire to do something else, if you do this one thing long enough and other people pigeonhole you as that, right? You start to believe it. Even if, even if you don't realize it consciously, unconsciously, you start to think like, I can't draw. I can color, I guess, but I can't mm -hmm. draw. And, and I think that I unconsciously started to internalize that. And then working at MTV as a storyboard artist, there, there really was a day where I was like, I do like 30 or 40 of these drawings a day. Certainly I can do six. Right. You know, if I can do six, that's a page. If I can yep. do a page a day, I can do comics, which mm -hmm. is all I ever cared about. I wasn't, I'm not an animator. I didn't, you know, I stayed in animation for as long as I did because it, it's also a, a cool industry and there was there used to be studios in new york and i liked people and you know it was great i enjoyed it but um i was my head was still um in comics you know really even though i wasn't doing any you know i i wanted to get back yeah nice um so so how did how did that lead to ao wolf let's <laughs> Uh, right, because because we're still like we're still twenty years sorry. ago, well, yeah, twenty years ago. But well, I just you know let's let let's 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 move it forward. Uh, I uh, I I was working in an animation studio. Every Wednesday, I would go to the local comic shop, which is St. Mark's Comics at that time, and um, I walked in, and there on the on the rack was a line of books by a publisher I'd never heard of before. They were beautiful. Uh, not only were the books beautiful in a, in a physical sort of way, but they were. Uh, topically, like, you know, non-genre, like, what is that? I've never seen a comic about that, right? And um, I bought all of them, and I took them home, told my girlfriend, I'm going to work for this company. That was first, second books. It was their first wave of books. Uh, I quit my job, and um, I, three months later, I was uh, working on my first for second book, which was uh, the Foiled series written by Jane Yolen. And um, I've been with First Second ever since, uh, as, as much as I can, you know, that involves a lot of finagling and pitching and um, rejection and et cetera. Uh, but, you know, I, I did several books uh, for them and others. Uh, you know, now I was sort of drawing again and uh, I was finally drawing comics and I, I was getting work on a successive series of different books as someone, as a collaborator, as someone who could take your, the script you've acquired and draw that in comic book form. And I did several of those. And while I was doing those, I still have that thing that I had since I was a kid where I want to do my stories, you know, and I was pitching those and I was getting, you know, I was getting a lot of rejection on my stories. Um, but uh, just because I wasn't a good writer yet, I didn't know how to write, you sure. know, and, and that exercise of pitch, reject, pitch, reject, you, you, you get better. Yeah. And um, somewhere in there, uh, uh, a cartoonist named Nick Abadzis, uh, he's, he's, uh, had come over to New York from the UK, he's a great artist and writer, put me in touch with this guy, Ben Sharp, who was editing um, at the Phoenix Magazine, which is a kids weekly comics magazine that comes out in the UK, it's a beautiful magazine. 
they're always on the lookout for someone to do like four page filler stories. Mm. And he put me together with this editor and was like, pitch him something. And at the time I was working part-time in a comic shop in Brooklyn. A lot of cartoonists came there from the area and also from all over the world and visit New York and stop by the shop. I met several of my heroes in the shop. And since on the side, I'm also cartooning. I'm always thinking of stories. And I thought of this idea of a kid who works in a store or heroes shop. And then I started to stick all that stuff I mentioned at the top, you know, all that sci-fi fantasy elements that I love around this kind of very basic idea. And that became Nico Bravo. And uh, the, the Phoenix went for it. I did four pagers in the Phoenix for years, a couple years. Um, that's where I learned to write a four page, four page stories, beginning, middle and end. Right. Make that happen. Yeah. And um, I, I really learned the world, the character and just how to write a story. Um, that was a boot camp. Right. And um, do you but, let me just let me just interrupt really quickly. Do you think that um, that doing four page stories helped you build that muscle to 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 learn how to tell a story? Right. Because you have to be concise. You can't fool around yeah yes indispensable i would indispensable like i said it was boot camp mm -hmm. the, the the hitch was they they, they wouldn't let me i want to do longer stories i, I like con really tangled absurd convoluted stories that's what i love and um I, you, you couldn't do it right and and so i just broke it off you know and 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 then i I had worked with it long enough to feel like, well, this is missing. We need a couple more characters. Nico's the only guy on staff. He needs some coworkers. We need to retool this, right? So I, I sort of changed the art style a little bit, um, retooled it. And uh, I, I, I swear, Brian, I'm getting to it. Um, no, it's all good. One last thing. One last thing, I, I mean, about, about this process, I just, I just want to say, like, I, I had I was so frustrated pitching and getting rejected that I got again I got to the point where I was like oh I'll just always get rejected I can draw your script but you'll never let me write that's what I thought right yeah. and um, even though I was doing this in the UK right um, so I made a 24 page comic book that I, I uh, a 24 page Nico Bravo comic book that had a beginning, a middle and an end. It was, it, it's not the book I was pitching. It was, I call it a pilot episode. It just shows you yeah. the world, the characters, how it functions. Yeah. And because I was like, well, I'm going to pitch this. Everyone will reject it. And instead of having a, a pile of paper, which is the traditional pitch material, I'm going to have a 24 page comic. Um, and, and then I could self publish that and at least sell it get some use out of it, sell it off a convention table, right? No. Um, I, I also had developed the conceit or the idea that I, I realized I'm a cartoonist. I'm not a writer. There's a difference, right? And making me the pitch material, making me the traditional package that, that editors, publishers seem to want plays to my weaknesses, right? I don't write like that. It's not even what I'm going to ultimately do for you. I don't know why you want it. Yeah. So I, I started to get a little, you know, angry about that sort of tradition of making cartoonists jump through writer's hoops, which was the result of the book market beginning to participate in comics, right? Yeah. It was an it's inevitable collision, you know. Right. Well, particularly, when you, particularly when you talk about First Second, right? Because First Second was, was an imprint of Macmillan. They were very much um, a, a book publisher in their DNA. Right. The difference, the difference with First Second, the reason I... I consider myself part of the first second family. It really is the people there. That's, sure. that's, I mean, like really it comes down to individuals and there's several people there, uh, primarily in my case, Mark Siegel, um, who's the editorial director there was Mark is a cartoonist. That's the difference. Yeah. That's hard to find at some of the other places, right? Yeah. Where the, the, the person steering the ship is necessarily a cartoonist. Mark's actually a cartoonist. We have many of the same influences and favorites, and mm -hmm. and I believe that we had you know simpatico in, in that way where he just got it, he just got it, and and I I didn't show a traditional pitch. I handed him a comic book, and they greenlit it, and that was the first Nico Bravo book. 
I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, that was the premise. I, I had another story. I, you know, I had to write the story, you mm-hmm. know, but that has become this series. Yeah, that's how that happened. Yeah. And so, uh, and so let me, let me just see if I'm, I'm following here. Uh, you were doing the four pagers in the UK, your 24 pager, you know, the, your self, your self published comic, let's call it. Um, did it, was that like eight of those or was that, did you reconceptualize it from the, from the start? Okay. I re, yeah, I made it for that express purpose. Yeah. yeah. And so, and then when, when, you showed that to them at first second. They said, no, we'll publish this. Did that then become the first chapter of the, no, as you, you, so you started a third time, essentially. It was just a pitch. I I actually, I gave them that comic with a page and a half synopsis. And I was saying, it's like this, but this is the story that I, I desire to tell. And I was so shocked. Mark texted me from the acquisitions meeting to say, this is a gr- this is a green light, nice. Right, I, I was shocked, and it was actually like a day or two later that I, I had to write him back and go, wait a minute, can I still self publish the, the other thing? And so I do, I do currently keep that in print. Like that's my I self publish that thing, mm-hmm. but um, it's not part of the first Nico Bravo book. It's a true pilot episode. It's like uh-huh. um, it just gives you a, a taste of the premise, the world. Uh, a little bit of how they interact, you know, that's it. It's, that's not part yeah. of the book. Yeah, cool. That's very cool. That's a that's a very cool uh, kind of, and long, but a very cool origin story. I, I love that. I love that. Um, and so um, what was the, what was the impetus to, well, how, first, actually, first off, how many Nico Bravo books are there? There's three, is that right? Or are there four? The three Nico Bravo books. And okay. then there's the Ewolf book one. I'm working on Ewolf book two. Yeah. And so, so what was, what was your thought for, um, for doing a spinoff uh, essentially, uh, you know, it, it's your after mash, I guess, or something. I, I don't know, but then boy, I, uh, <laughs> that, that really, that really dated me. Sorry, kids. I <laughs> <laughs> look up mash. Um, it wasn't intentional. I, uh, I want to do Nico Bravo or Nico Bravo world books for the rest of my life if possible um so um third the e-wolf is a became a very important character in the series um she's prominent in the first two nico books third book she's really not in right and and so i started toying with like where was she what happened and so nico bravo 4 was always intended as um where was e-wolf and then we were going to come back to every to everyone like go back to what we were doing before right and in the process of making that book i started to realize like this is wholly different it yeah this is wholly different than a nico book because the characters are so different and the yeah. story has to manifest itself different and and i'm able to approach the world i've established um from a completely different point of view and flesh it out in a way that would be impossible if Nico was in the spotlight, right? Um, and it just it just grew organically. And so Mark was like, well, you can still tell uh, the other stories. You just put her in the in the center, right? You just turn it a little bit. And so uh, that took some retooling. And that's really what I'm in the, in the process of doing. You know, um, it just kind of grew. It was an outgrowth sort of. Yeah. That's, 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 that's cool that it was supposed to be Nico Bravo four and it ended up being its own thing. I love that. Uh, and I love, I love the fact that, that, that they supported you on, on making that change. And, you know, because some publishers certainly would go, uh, I think you should stick with the thing you've already, you're already doing well and that we know works, you know, and that's that they what I'm saying. Exactly. Forward, you know? Yeah. 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 I like that quite a bit. I like that quite a bit. Um, uh, so Eowulf, um, obviously has, 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 uh, you know, at least the spiritual grandfather of Beowulf. Um, how, how did you, how, how did, how did you make that particular, uh, a, a dish, I suppose? How did I decide that it was, uh, the lineage from Beowulf? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's always a favorite story of mine. You know, okay. if, if you, if you've made 
a, a series or whatever that's supposed to be a blender for for world myths you know mm -hmm. that that one's gonna it was gonna find its way in and and it, there's a there's a martial aspect to to be a wolf you know he's a fighter and yeah. i needed a fighter for that character in the first book yeah. Ewolf was never supposed to be this important she she took over you know she took over so um you know the characters they just sort of start to live and breathe so you know yeah i, I can see that i can see that um uh, what's your what's your process uh, at this point of of pitching a book like this are you is it all just talking it out um or are you at this point writing a formal pitch document no okay no i'm, not, um, I, I'm just asking because everybody does it a little differently sure yeah. which is which is great um for for me if, if we're talking about an uh, a nico related project um i've done you know, I've done 10 books or something for, for, for a second. We've, we've known each other for a long time. It's very, it's informal. And so if I'm pitching something that's going to um, hip check this world in some way or come out of this world in some way, I just, I, I write a brief synopsis that, you know, they know what it looks like and they get my sensibilities and that, you know, that's that. If, if I'm, if I'm approaching like a wider proposal where it's going to go out to a bunch of different publishers, I, I kind of have to, flesh that out they got to show them what it looks like and you know as much as i can veer towards the template of you know, like lean hard on cartooning and get mm -hmm. as far away from written material as possible <clears throat> i try to do that you know just for the reasons i stated um i i, you know, I would tell anybody at, you know wondering about that i would say like you need to get your ideas across that's all it doesn't sure. matter how you get your ideas across it, it, sure. you have to communicate what the premise is to sometimes to non-artists. And so as long as you can put something in front of someone that, that does that, it's yeah. fine. The, the guidelines are guidelines. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I suppose there's two different questions there, right? One is what do you give to a company uh, to get them to go, yes, we'll publish that. And in, in your case with First Second, you've got a good relationship. You don't necessarily have to do something big and formal. But the other part of it is, what do you do for yourself to kind of keep you on track? I suppose you like, do you write yourself a script at all? No, just a synopsis. Yeah. Yeah. And is that, is that, and how, how detailed of a synopsis do you write for yourself or, you know, cause it's a 200 page book or whatever. Like what, what do you, before you start drawing, before you, like what's the thing that you make for yourself so that you know where the beginning and the middle and the end is you want to see sure okay let's let's see if this happens here just a yeah you, there's a little button down at the bottom for to share the screen and uh and you pop it up and then we'll get it up on screen ourselves there it goes you see that yep yep that is actually the outline for the first Nico Bravo book. That's the real actual outline. It's not a prop for the, for the purpose uh -huh. of the slideshow. It's a page and a half. The book is 186 pages. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. It tells the beginning, the middle, and the end of, of what happens in the story in very broad strokes and yeah. in very compressed uh, sentences. Yeah. Um, and then, um, then I do that. And so I, I just look at the next sentence, which could ultimately expand to be 10, 15, or 20 pages of comics because it's that compressed. And I just start trying to figure out um, what's happening on this page, how many panels, who's, you know, uh, what, what does it look like? Uh, I, you see, I'm, I'm figuring out the dialogue. It's happening yep. here. Yep. Right? Um, once the dialogue is set, I, you know, I, I do the lettering, I rule the panel borders, I, I start to clean up the art. That's final inks. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You see, I redraw balloons and borders because I don't. I, I'm working in Clip Studio. I don't like digital borders and balloons. I like little lumpy imperfections. So I re I trace over uh, those digital ones. I get a little lumpy uh, as I like it, and and there's the color. Wow. 
and 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 that's it. That's my process. Wow, you're uh, you're you're really your uh, thumbnail to your final product is is pre- that was pretty close. There was there was not a there was not a lot of huge amount of variation. No, and and that that um, that example it's getting getting kind of old. And I've probably cut out one or two steps uh, yeah. by this point. It also depends on the page. Some pages need a little more figuring out, so there's a rough and then a little less rough. And some pages are like conversations, and and you just kind of draw. It. You know, sure, it's digital, sure. so you know, you just go draw. You can erase. You know, so sure. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, uh, but you're. So you've got a synopsis, a very, very bare bones synopsis. You're then uh, story, you know, uh, 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 doing thumbnails essentially of of the whole book. How do you? Yeah. Um, are you? How, how how do I ask this question? Are you giving that to your editor at any point, or are you waiting until you have the whole thing, all two hundred pages or whatever it is? laid out before you start trying to get editorial input oh, this is going to get me in trouble brian um i well i i don't show anything until i'm done yeah so i i got to get to the end of the thumbnail stage it'll be lettered and thumbnailed before anyone sees it um letter two interesting interesting it'll have actual the lettering will be done that's that will be done right I mean, of course, there's editorial, you know, this and that. But um, for the most part, um, I always say that Mark gives me plenty of rope to hang myself. Um, He really, uh, he really doesn't micromanage. Sure. Uh, There's very little of that. I'll tell you, in these books, in the first book, I gave him that. And, and then I gave him a couple of weeks to check it out. And I was like, what do you think? And he goes, I loved it. Um, you got to change the ending. But that's what he said. It was, yeah. it was devastating. Yeah. That, but that was the extent of his editorial yeah. direction. Got to change that ending. And I was like, yeah. oh, what? You know, it was yeah. destabilizing for me. Panic. What do you mean, right? He does, but Mark, uh, he, he doesn't give you answers. He gives you challenges right and, yeah. and and you have to solve that in your in your voice and in your vernacular right and um it was because he said that that eowulf um changed genders mm. uh went from a, a very awful unlikable antagonist to the eowulf that we see in the series it was it was that that comment that for, you know reversed through the book uh-huh altered the kind of the adventure yeah. right um that's his editing style he didn't give me any other direction yeah right? he just threw that at me and left it <laughs> left me to figure it out i, I kind of love I that know. but it but it makes me it makes me wonder um how much did you did you have to go and essentially do a page one rewrite or like how much were you changing of 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 your thumbnails that you had done at that point a lot yeah 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 was that um was that freeing to, yeah to, it yeah? was fine the thumbnails are fast you yeah know? the whole style is fast it's meant to be fast you know it's a fast style it's you know uh, the thumbnails were, were not a problem and they're large swaths of the book that don't involve you at all but you know um, you change a couple things and, uh-huh. um, it, it really, it really went somewhere else. And, and, um, you know, my, I'm learning to write and, you know, the, really the only, the only thing I have to lean on is this idea that you let the characters steer the ship. So I have an outline and in some books it, the, the end product has, adhere pretty closely to that outline in other books like like the eowulf book is very different it, it just veered and veered and veered and veered and it just kept going somewhere that i didn't know it was going to go um it surprised me on various times you know but that's because you're letting the characters steer yeah, yeah i'm not i'm not trying to force you back to my outline i'm, I'm trying to keep up with 
what the characters yeah. are saying. That's how I write. It's yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Does um, uh, how long does it take you to 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 thumbnail out two hundred pages? Um, you know, I thumbnail five to ten pages a day. That includes the lettering. Okay. That's that's, wow, that's I that's, aim for five. Yeah, that's yeah. that's like that's like Kirby level. Yeah, thumbnails. You you know they're loose. They're you know I'm not. No, I know. But yeah, they're loose. That's that's a, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of a lot of engagement. <laughs> you know, a full day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, and then when you um, when you go to your next step, I mean, I I don't I don't know if I should call them pencils since that's because that's not really the the, no, the, that's, the right. You're right. Yeah, but it is essentially the pencil stage. Yeah. Um, how how long does it take you to to do that page? Um, a comfortable day where I I am uh, done by before dinner. And I can cook dinner and then relax with my girlfriend and have an yeah. evening. Is I do two two pages a day. That that's okay. be like inked. That's that's pretty that's fast. Not just pencils. It's like a done page, finished page. Really? Okay. So you're yeah. so you're at this at this point then you're you're kind of skipping an interstitial stage there. You're not penciling and then inking it as separate stages. It's all at one. Huh. We so we pencil from, so from we can erase thumbnail to finished art. Wow. Okay. Okay. I love that. This is this is what I love about talking to cartoonists because because you never get the same answer twice. You know of of how did you make this work? Um, uh, I've never heard anyone do it in exactly precisely that way. You know, and I've I've spoken to three hundred cartoonists probably. You know, everybody's got some little variation or of how they do it or, you know, yeah, sure. that, that's kind of, that, that's kind of neat. Um, Again, Mark, Mark was someone who, who I think Mark was throwing down that gauntlet. Don't pencil. Terrified yeah. me. You know, I yeah. laughed. First time he said, don't pencil. Yeah. <laughs> I laughed. You can't do that. <laughs> you got to pencil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not true. <laughs> but it depends. Yeah, yeah. It depends on what you're doing, you know. Yeah. And you said you work all digitally, yeah? Yeah. Is that, um, did you used to work on paper? Is is this oh, yeah. a, a relatively new? Okay. Uh huh. I don't think it's new at at, at this stage. You know, um, I, I mean, it's been years since I started making that migration. You know, you, you remember Draw Magazine, and you know, Mike Manley sure. was involved with with Draw Magazine. Yep. There was, I loved that magazine, and there was one issue that had Dave Gibbons writing about his process. Uh, at that time, you know, I and mean, he kind of outlined this amalgam of like doing a little bit on paper, but then scanning it into Photoshop. That's where we were at, you know, we were scanning yeah, yeah, yeah. and then, um, and then et cetera, et cetera. Like this, this process is a great article. And that really influenced me and I adopted that. And then over the years I kept, you know, you, you tweak that, that's your template and you start tweaking that for your own comfort. And, and like little by little, I was looking for some way to bring this all under one roof because that involved drawing on paper, scanning, working in Photoshop yeah. a little bit, using Illustrator to letter. You know, it's a lot of files, right? So yeah, yeah. yeah it would be great to bring this all under one roof. And so I started experimenting with Manga Studio, which became Clip Studio. And it has some drawbacks, but uh, it's, it's been improving. And the last couple books I've done, I've done in... Um, in Clip Studio on an iPad. On an iPad, okay. Yeah. On, a, on, on just like um, eight and a half by 11 kind of iPad. You're gonna, you're gonna get my dirty fingerprinty screen, but you know, my iPad. Nice. It's, you know, it's an iPad Pro, it's whatever that is, whatever that size that is, 12 inches or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and you have a stylus, you're, you're drawing with a, like a little stylus, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's great. Interesting. Wow. Uh, Clip, Clip Studio works great on it. You know, at, you don't know over the over the years. You don't you don't know how many like family gatherings, weddings, vacations, whatever that I've missed because I got a deadline. I'm chained to the drafting table. You know, yeah. and like iPad and some of these apps and, and programs that we have now. Like I uh, Nico Bravo too. I I drew. You know, I I got to the inking drawing stage in the summer. And I would, you know, go to Bryant Park and find a chair or a bench and sit in the park and plug into the 
public Wi-Fi and listen to a Yankees game and draw two pages in the park and I'd be yeah. done as the sun was setting and I'd have a beautiful day in the park getting two pages of comics done yeah. is life altering, you know, yeah, I'm a proponent yeah. for working digitally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um you're you're teaching at SVA, is that right? Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yep. And so uh what percentage of your students would you say uh are embracing working digitally versus those who who you know are keeping themselves under a more traditional pen and paper the way the school is currently set up uh, uh freshmen and sophomore are not allowed to work digitally you have to uh work oh i like that actually i like that quite a bit actually yeah mm -hmm. after that there's a lot of electives and classes you can take mm -hmm. uh you know to learn some digital methods if you haven't been experimenting on your own yeah. and then and students are free to work however they want i would say the majority of my students are working predominantly digital uh, there's yeah. there are some who are inking on paper but i i don't think uh, i think the percentage is more uh towards digital they, they're really comfortable in a digital environment yeah the the thing i hear from from some people at least is that they like the um they like kind of the feedback from from the paper and and how how a pen feels going across the page that, that's like part of their process you know sure. um is is that is that that feedback haptic feedback i guess i i there's some things i miss about inking with a brush yeah and, you know i won't lie there's a lot of things i don't miss yeah. and i think you know what gets lost especially when when i speak with cartoonists about this issue there you know people have strong feelings about working digitally or not working digitally um obviously there's no right answer here but for for me personally right i i work in the book market and i do a lot of middle grade stuff and that has an economy to it mm -hmm. right um it's not the same model or the same economy as uh working in the direct market for direct market publishers where you get a page rate okay? sure the rates are different the sure. work it's a different world Right. Yeah. And so what what I have what I'm always doing is I'm, I'm fine tuning and balancing project after project, um, a, a method of working that makes me happy. Right. Which is why I pursued art. I want to do something that I love in a way that makes me happy and not be angry and disgruntled and miserable about you know, my my day. Right. Yeah. And, and but I have to I have to do that. But I have to do that, do that with an eye on the reality of. The, the business that, that I'm involved in, right? So uh, I have a reaction. When, when people come at me sometimes where they're real proponents for working traditionally, I, it's great. I'm, I'm not trying to convert anyone. If you're happy, do it. But um, the, with that economy in mind, working digitally allows me to um, create comic book pages in a way that's feasible and, and sustainable right um it doesn't help me to adhere to some sort of tradition that um burns me out um and and means that uh i that it's not sustainable sure right and and there is a very real thing like you know i loved working on strathmore 500 bristol with a windsor newton brush and black magic ink and i'm sorry manufacturers your product is garbage now. It is not what it was 15 mm. or 20 years ago. It mm. ain't. And you know it. I, I've had exchanges with mm. customer service at some of these places, and they'll say it, right? So, that, you know, I, I abandoned paper when it's I'm trying to ink something, and the paper is, the ink is just, yeah, you yeah. Know, it's like working on toilet paper, right? And this is very expensive stuff, and I have a deadline. So I'm like, Okay, if you can't make a product that I can do a professional job on when I need sure. to do a professional no, it makes job, sense. right? Then yeah. I'm not going to use it, to, you know. Yeah. And the, and the paper manufacturers blame the ink manufacturers. So we had to change our paper formula because they cheaped out on their ink. And you talk to them, and they said, "Well, we changed the ink because their paper is not as good, right?" Anymore, right. And so I'm just like, you know what? I'm uh, I'll go work on the iPad. I'll go sit in the park and I'll get my yeah. work done. It'll look the same every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, that that's interesting. That that's really interesting. Um, uh, so okay, if you're doing ten to twenty pages of thumbnails, 
five that's to ten. Five to ten. Okay. Let's 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 use ten as the number on a two hundred page book. That's twenty. That's like three weeks to to thumbnail a book. Probably a month, month and a half. Yeah. 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 And then if you're doing two pages a day, three months to do the finished book. Four months, maybe. I wish it never works out. That was. Ah, okay. always these... <laughs> I wish, man. I wish. There's always interruptions and yeah. unforeseen stuff, and you you get you you shoot for two pages a day, but you did one. Yeah. Uh, I had I had a scene in in the current one that is five point perspective, and I I actually don't know how to do that, and I was like, mm. this will make me learn, and it took days. Right. And that was a two page spread, right? So that was two pages, it took me several days to do because I was like, I'm gonna figure out five point perspective. It's that it's like that. So yeah, it it um you know, a book takes me a year. Yeah. A, a year plus. You know, when you when then there's the color, you know. It takes me a year plus. How 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 long does the coloring take you? Well, I, I all these books I've done with help. So there's a colorist on on every book. And I just, I just kind of, I'm, I mean, I'm a colorist, right? So unfortunately for them, I'm a little bit of a tyrant when it comes to color. Color is very important to my work. It's very important to the world uh, here uh, that I'm, I'm making. So um, I work very closely with the colorists and uh, they, they're all like an amalgam of like, um, they, they do things that I wouldn't have done that uh, work. But, but I never would have thought of it. And then there's yeah. other things where I'm like, no, it's got to be this way, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So I get my like they they work a little and push it to me. I might tweak something and push it back to them. And that's how we work. I'm working with someone right now, and it's really what we're doing. You know, she takes a stab. Her um, uh, her name is Sarah Buck. She's done a, a number of comics. And she, she takes a stab at it, and pushes it to me, and I do some stuff and give it back to her. And it's like that. It's, yeah. it's weirdly organic. So you're so you're working in like batches of ten or batches of twenty something yeah, like that. Probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nice. We have like an animation style color meeting every week. I got I got nice. that from working in animation where we nice. we meet every week on Zoom uh -huh. and uh, we 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 look at what she did and then we look at what she's gonna do uh -huh. in case uh -huh. I can say like oh that scene you know uh, try this you know what yeah, I mean yeah. and so we just try to keep tabs on it like that and just communicate. Yeah, and you're doing all of this without without the editor being directly involved, right? Right. Yeah. You're, you're, are you, at this point, are you essentially giving them a finished book? Yeah. 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 I'm a Scorpio. Yeah. I dig it. I dig it. <laughs> uh, the lettering, the lettering you're doing yourself? Yeah. Uh, you're a font based on your handwriting? No. I always wish I had done that. I'm lazy. Mm -hmm. So it's a commercial font then? Yeah, it's uh I love Comic Craft is great. You know, I mm -hmm. I have a lot of Comic Craft fonts to use those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does it I mean I, I'm assuming that the the lettering is is part of that penciling inking stage, right? Like it's all one organic stage there. It's part of the thumbnail stage. Yeah. Oh, you're yeah, doing I mean, you're doing it in the thumbs. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. You got a letter in your thumbs because yeah. that's I mean, that's your page mechanics, right? Yeah. You're, you're how, lettering. How, how often uh, do you find that you need to go and change when when you get to the final steps? Uh, yeah, there's a significant amount because I'm I'm a terrible speller and um, <laughs> my grammar is terrible. So uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, you know, we we have copy editors who in the last stage of the book they're, they're going through looking for all my dumb mistakes and. And um, I just changed those. Yeah. You know. uh, if, uh, because you're already baking in the ballooning, does that ever cause you any problems w on that copy edit rewrite stage where you need to re-balloon or? Um, it should, but um, I really, it hasn't. It hasn't. Okay, no, that's great. I. Doesn't it, it's not that it should. I'm just I'm asking questions. That's all, you know. Uh, I, I, I love I love the fact that it doesn't. Well, you know, because because again, as you say, you're a cartoonist, right? And so, a big part of cartooning is balancing all of the elements of the page. You know, right? 
And, and, you know, it's like we were talking about before, like you, you build up muscles, you know, and at a certain point, like you are, you know how it's going to work. It, it's going to be what it's going to be, you know? Yeah. I, I like to preserve a little bit of that because in, in this age, um, you can make it anything after the fact. And I, and I feel like it that just loses a little bit of what I love about comics. You know, yeah. there's a lo-fi quality to the comics that I love that I kind of want to, I kind of want to be part of, of my work. And again, one, one of the things I like about the culture at, at first second and is like they have their protocol and they give you their guidelines and there's things they'd like you to do, but they also recognize that my book is my book and, and that the next, person's book it's, it's totally different and, yeah. and we have totally different sensibilities and yeah. and there's a guy Kirk Benshoff over there's the art director and there's this great staff that works with him that they get that you know they get that like um my book doesn't have to be done or executed or or the same way that the the other sure. book that's currently sure. being made has, has there's no reason for that right yeah. so within within some sort of professional standards like they roll with that so yeah yeah, no, I mean, and and the fact that you've been successful doing it, you know, like makes it easier next time for them to go. Yes, he he knows what he's doing. They totally tolerate me. Yeah, yeah, no, I love it. I I, I absolutely love it. Um, how much how much in the thumbnail stage are you thinking about um, things like the page turn? A lot. I mean, a lot. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's when you, so it. when you thumbnail, are you thumbnailing a page at a time or are you doing them as double page spreads so you can see that with that question in mind, like the, the smart thing to do would be double page spreads. I don't like it. It bugs me. Mm -hmm. So that, that you, you ought to, I don't. Uh, mm -hmm. The thing is that um, uh, Clip Studio has. Uh, two views this is a page you're working on but it also has this like they call it the story view where you can mm. see the entire book and you can see it as spreads right so that's there you know it's yeah. in my line of sight but it's not how i i've got the, the page open in in my software in front of me I, I have one page but i got an eye on that and and you know i i, I frequently read through and i catch stuff where i was like oh that's got to be its own page or we need a mm -hmm. page break here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. because it's digital, it's very modular. You grab yeah, this from sure. here and shove it over there. It's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent, excellent. Now, obviously, this would be very different if you were working on a on a direct market kind of comic because you wouldn't know where the ads are, and and you don't know where your page turn is necessarily anymore. And and a, and a host of 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 other things where yeah. I think you know, I I think there's a lot more eyes on it. You know, at least at the level I'm. I'm working, I'm not working at a direct market superstar level where maybe they have a, a certain amount of freedom that I, I didn't experience when I was, you know, doing stuff for DC or, 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 or whatever, you know, but um, I think there's just a lot of more scrutiny than I'm accustomed to. Sure, 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 sure. A lot of freedom, you know. Yeah. Particularly given that it's middle grade stuff that you're working on, um, did you, do you feel find that you have to uh change your own sensibilities at all or or is your own sensibility a middle grade sens sen sensibility um i don't have to, i don't um i don't change anything really yeah. um i i uh i write what i th i think uh is true, you know, to that moment of the story, or that it has to happen in that moment of the story. And someone told me a long time ago, uh, someone I was working with said, um, we would rather have to dial something back than artificially amp it up to make it interesting. Right. Sure. And I, I, I've always taken that to heart and I, and I, I go for it when I write. And I, I don't mean this in a negative way, but I, I don't think about the middle grade audience at all really i think it's closer to what you're saying is i i think i'm i'm probably mentally 15 and or less um <laughs> it's not quite um, how i phrased it but yeah okay no that's what that's how my girlfriend would phrase it um <laughs> I, you know i do what i do I, I try to entertain me i'm trying to make myself laugh and be interested yeah. i i'm thrilled when my characters surprise me which is often that's yeah. my goal and um and i i just let all that unroll and i figure 
if we're if I hand that in and someone is like you can't do this, then we're going to cross that bridge. Yeah. Then. Well, Mike, I think it comes across, man. I mean, I think the uh, I think that the joy that you feel when you're cartooning comes across in the page. Uh, it comes across in the work. I mean, it's certainly why why we picked this as as this month's selection. So thank you. You know, because I can I can feel it crackles. You know, it crackles in just the right way. You know, thank so you. Um, yeah. When I yeah. get this kind of question from a student, I always say I tell them, um, if you're bored, we will be bored. Yeah. If you're if you're psyched, we will be psyched. It permeates the page. It comes off the page. There's yeah. no two ways around it. Yeah. Very much yeah. so. Very much so. All right. Well, let's uh, let's let's bring it to the wrap up. Uh, I always have the same the same two questions at the wrap up. Same as the question at the beginning. the The first one is well, you, and you already kind of partially answered it that there's going to be a second Aowulf. Um, that's what you're actively working on right now is second Aowulf. Yeah. yeah. How how far into it are you? I've drawn half of it. Nice. Uh, it's it's all written. It's all thumbnailed. You know, yeah, it's yeah. all lettered. I've drawn uh, half of it. Um, Sarah is, um, is coloring. She's coloring is underway. Nice. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. And after that, do you know what the next thing is? Got a couple more of these I, I would like to do. Yeah. Uh, more Aowulf or, or Nico Bravo or, or like what, what's, what's sort of your intention? Not, I'm not holding it to you, obviously. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I only have so much control over it. Um, well, you know, the, 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 the Eowulf book that I'm working on now really loops the entire um, staff from the previous, previous books back in. Nico's in it. Everyone's in it, right? Nice. And so that, that, that was kind of the goal, was to just make this family a little bit bigger, um, maybe turn the camera a little bit to a different POV. But um, uh, that I want to I work in that world and work with those characters. And, you know, I'd love to spin off some other character or, or, or something like that. I, I just... I'm having the most fun I've ever had, you know, working yeah. on on this stuff. I mean, what what more could you ask for? I mean, just no. I mean, not. I'm, I mean, I'm not much. Honestly, that, yeah. that that sounds like the best of all worlds. Um, uh, I I guess part of my question is is like, where are you in the process of the thing after Ao Wolf Two? Have you started writing that? Have you started? I, I have I have a couple couple more books outlined. Okay, you know. And which, you know, at that point I would, I would start drawing. So they're, yeah. they're really in good shape. I, you know, I have particular specific stories, you know, that I think follow this up and nice. I've got a few of those. <laughs> yeah. So you could conceptually see this going on for five more years, 10 more years easily. I would love that. Yeah. Love it. Knock wood. <laughs> love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, well, we'll certainly keep an eye out for uh, for the second Aowulf. Do you do you have a, a a title for it yet, or is it Aowulf Two? Is it? Uh... It's uh, the working title is uh, Aowulf, uh, the Creature Connection. Ooh, I like that. Uh, but but that could change. You know, the the title for this one was Aowulf, uh, the Descendant Dilemma, and mm. I think the folks at first second were like, you can't say it, it doesn't roll off the tongue uh -huh. so uh -huh. that got changed so creature connection could change you know i, like, I, I, I think, think it, it, connection it, rolls though you know yeah i did a better job on that yeah, 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 yeah i love yeah. it i love it uh cool and then the last thing is you know um this is a series obviously this is you know uh uh we're we're at some 300 interviews at this point um mm. uh it's actually kind of insane how many people i've interviewed at this point um but one of the things that I that I hear from regular watchers, you know, are there's a, there's a good contingent of people who want to make their own comics, um, who who want to make their own comics, and you know, either they have a little level of imposter syndrome, or they're just not sure that they have what it takes, or or they don't know where to start, or you know, I mean, you deal with students, right? Now your students already know that they want to do this and they're and they're in right because they're at, a, at an art school but i'm thinking about like the ones who are on the edge right now who like they don't know they don't know what to do so what would be your piece of advice for someone who feels like they want to make comics but but doesn't feel like they're there yet what what, what would what would be the advice that you would give them it could be something mechanical it could be something um intellectual it could be something spiritual like what but what, what would that be for you 
we're never there yet. And if you wait to be there yet, you'll never be there. Um, mm. You have to just make comics. That's the way to make comics is to make comics. The way to get better at making comics is that the uh, the way to progress, uh, to get noticed, to achieve whatever level of whatever it is you want to achieve is to is you got to make it. You can't talk about it. You got to do it. And uh, one thing that's changed uh, for younger people than maybe when I was a teenager is is. Uh, you have access to uh, the internet. You can you can make uh, web comics. You can serialize them on Instagram or whatever for free. Um, you know, and and by doing that, you're you're honing your skills. You're building an audience, and you're showing. Um, I mean, maybe getting ahead of ourselves, but you're showing publishers or uh, employers that you can uh, garner an audience, tell a story, and maintain a schedule, which are the skills that they look for. So it's all at your fingertips. Uh, no amount of um, theorizing about it will help. Uh, the The beauty of comics is the is the low threshold for entry. To to make comics, you make comics. You don't need you don't need anything else, right? You can do it with a pencil and paper. Um, yeah, just do it. Yeah, that's you know cer certainly not the case of uh, being a filmmaker or an animator or something like that, where you need all these people around you and this whole support system. You can make comics yourself. That's a really important thing. That's right. I love it, Mike. I love it. I love it. Well, man, I, I really appreciate the time that that you're, you're. We're actually we're past past an hour. You were asking me how long is it be? Hour and fifteen already. Doesn't feel like we were talking for an hour and fifteen, does it? I, I talk too much. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. I just I love I love talking about comics. It's it's all good. Me too. Uh, me too. Me too. Hang for a second. I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping here, and then then I'll bring you back to, to close up the show. Um, okay, you. You're sitting at home. Uh, you, you, you want something to read. You're not quite sure what to read. Believe me, I understand this. A.O. Wolf, this is, this is fun. It's action-packed. It's, it's full of joy. It's, it's everything that you want in a comic, so absolutely buy this. Uh, you can... There's a click if you're watching the video. You'll be able to click on and buy it directly from us. There's going to be something across the bottom of the screen in a second here too. Um, but, but get the book. It's really, really, really good. Um, I want to tell you that uh, coming up next, this is next Sunday. This is for our adult club. Um, but, uh, but we're going to be talking to uh, uh, Ngozi Ukazu and Mad Rupert about Bunt, um, which was a really, really swell, swell book. You're going to really like this one. So tune in next Sunday. Uh, and then next month, when we return for Kids Club uh, for April, uh, it's going to be Dave Roman and Unicorn Boy, which is completely one of the craziest comics I have ever read. And all of you kids are going to love this one so much. This is this is an insane comic where just nuts things happen on every page. You're, you're going to love it. So those are the next uh, the next couple of books coming up. Um, you know, hit that bell, subscribe, do the thing. You know how it all works. Um, I got a couple of thank yous I want to make. Um, I want to thank uh, I want to thank Ben for running the show. Um, I want to thank Jordan for being my producer and doing all the, the backstage stuff that you guys just don't see, but that we couldn't have a show without it. Um, I want to thank my staff, uh, Zoe, Kat, Katie, and Max, um, for being the best staff a comic shop could have and letting me sit and. and interview cartoonists which is kind of cool um i wouldn't be able to do that if they weren't doing such a great job uh you know uh help me run the store and, and taking care of business and all that so thank y'all um i want to thank all of you all at home who are watching these interviews um everyone who's a member of the club we can't do this without your membership you know and um and so we really really appreciate the fact that you that you have joined with us and then last but certainly not least I want to thank the cartoonists who make these things because if it wasn't for that, I couldn't have these conversations. Uh, and so, I, Mike, I, I, you are going to represent all cartoonists right now for this part. Thank you very much for doing the thing that you do and uh, and making making things that 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 thrill us and fill our days and and give us things to talk about. I thank you so much, man. Thank thank you. It really is a community. Uh, none of this works without all of us, you know, 
I can't make books without you and, and you can't do this without our books. And, you know, it really is a um, ecosystem. Yep. It really you. is. It really is. Yeah. I love you, buddy. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Uh, stick around at the end of the show. We'll talk for another second. But other than that, I'm going to see everybody next week and next month. Thanks. Thank you for watching this episode of the Graphic Novel of the Month Club. If you enjoyed what you were watching, please uh, subscribe and hit that bell up in the top corner. If you enjoyed the books that we're talking about and the creators that we're talking to, every month we pick a brand new book. Uh, the staff votes on it. It's a program that helps keep our store alive, and we'd love to have you as a member. You'll get a new book every month. Just follow that URL at the bottom of the screen.